Hello. My name is Dr. Alicia Cosma. I am the director of Indiana University Cinema. <clears throat> and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Jorgensen Guest Filmmaker Conversation with Maya Cade. I'd like to start by thanking the OFW Jorgensen Foundation and specifically Jane and Jay Jorgensen for endowing this series, which has helped bring renowned international film prof professionals to Indiana University. I'd also like to thank IU's Black Philanthropy Circle and Women's Philanthropy Leadership Council for their generous support of Maya's programming residence this past month, as well as the Black Student Union, Indiana Daily Students Black Voices, the Black Film Center and Archive, the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies, and the Asian Culture Center for their partnership. Maya S. Cade is the creator and curator of Black Film Archive, a first of its kind digital archive likened to be the definitive history of black cinema by Slate.com. She is the inaugural Connecting Digital Communities Initiative Scholar in Residence at the Library of Congress, as well as the only person in history to win multiple esteemed special critic awards in the same season. Receiving special distinction by the New York Film Critics Circle, the National Society of Film Critics, and the Alliance of Women Film Journalists. In the years since Black Film Archive's 2021 launch, Maya's achievement has been featured in countless publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Hollywood Reporter, NPR, the Paris Review, and Sight and Sound. In February 2023, she will present her guest film curation at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest film museum in the world. Maya has served on the jury for several film festivals across the country, presented on the future of black cinema worldwide, and was named a culture shifter by Huffington Post. Additionally, she was the fall 2021 research fellow at our own Black Film Center and Archive. As the fall 2022 programmer in residence here at the cinema, Maya has curated a one-of-a-kind cinematic experience over the past month, bringing theatrically underscreened short form filmmaking and hallmarks of classic and contemporary Black cinema to Bloomington. Her program, Home is Where the Heart Is, Black Cinema's Exploration of Home is a thoughtfully and expansively curated collection of work that provides an intimate look into the many mutations of the idea of home across the spheres of family, ancestry, queerness, body, and transition. The format of today's event will be an onstage conversation between Maya and past Jorgensen guest, Isabel Sandoval. Director, actress, writer, producer, and editor Isabel Sandoval is a Filipina filmmaker whose film, Lingua Franca, made history at the 2019 Venice International Film Festival as the first film directed by and starring a trans woman of color to ever screen in competition. The film has earned her a nomination for Film Independence John Cassavetes Award and was theatrically distributed by Ava DuVarnay's Array Now Initiative. Isabel directed Revelation, an episode of the limited television series Under the Banner of Heaven, for which she received a Best Directing nomination from the Hollywood Critics Association Television Awards. Most recently, she was welcomed as a member of the Academy Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It's a very big deal. There'll be time at the conclusion of this evening's conversation for an audience question and answer period and we welcome you all to stay for one of Maya's programming blocks, showcasing the short film African Woman USA and Charles Burnett feature, My Brother's Wedding, beginning at 9 p.m. But now, please help me in welcoming Maya and Isabel. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled to be on stage um, talking to Maya. Um, we actually just met for the first time yeah. in person yesterday, although we've been following each other and championing each other <laughs> on social media <laughs> since the pandemic. We have a pandemic. game that we play of hyping each other up online, and we're happy to do it in real life, so that's going to be fun. Um, Maya has just been one of the most luminous and inspiring presence, you know, on Twitter. And, of course, your groundbreaking, pioneering, stellar work on the Black Film Archive. But my first question for you, Maya, is... 
What was the very first film that you fell in love with? And you remember exactly when and where you saw it and what particular moment or scene that you said, I love this movie. Okay. Um, I have two answers. So the very, 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 very first was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> I remember as a child repeating to my family to the point that it became an inside joke, you lose, you get nothing. <laughs> and I talked about that a lot. <laughs> it, was, it was my personality. Um, but I would say that the other was The Wiz. I really, really loved The Wiz. And actually in the pandemic, I watched it every day. I was obsessed <laughs> with the whiz. And I think in the pandemic, I was trying to figure out, or I was thinking through what home meant in this moment that everything around me was changing. And I could turn on the whiz and see Dorothy's journey on the way home. And has she worked out that the journey is as important as the destination? I was trying to comfort myself in the same way to say, okay, what this, you know, this crisis that we're going through now, perhaps this is a, something I'm, I'm meant to go through. And though I would not wish suffering on anyone, of course, but, you know, like I was trying to comfort myself in that way. So, yeah. And it was after one of those pandemic viewings of The Wiz that you felt the calling I, you are correct. Um, after the 900th viewing of The Wiz and, and the George Floyd protest, I was really just thinking about the fact that there isn't anything like Black Film Archive. Because what I remember about the George Floyd protest, really, was everyone talking about how limited Black film is. People were saying, oh my God, all black films are dramatic and they're, you know, they're this, they're that. And, and, you know, and this being the worst film you've ever seen and that being the most dramatic film you've ever seen. And there was just nothing in the middle or, and nothing else that black film had to offer. And I was seeing The Wiz and For Love of Ivy and, you know, all these films that I own because I am a film collector. And I'm like, huh, like we're not. No, there, and I don't ever blame people for not knowing something. I think that's a very vicious way <laughs> to to look at the world, and I'm I'm quite earnest and optimistic. So, um, but I was just like, mm, th there's not anything that people can go to. Of course, these conversations are happening. I mean, if you're not thinking of books as reference points anymore, and the internet has moved us to the point that that really isn't true. We think about Wikipedia as a reference. What there was, I, I felt like there was an avenue in, in which something could come and um, be that reference point. So, Black Film Archive was born. <laughs> I'm curious, what what do you think makes a movie great? What makes it, what makes a movie transcend simply being entertainment and be actually a work of art? Yeah, you know, that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And honestly, my answer is maybe a funny one. I think that art can transcend when it knows it's rooted in reality, when it has some basis of truth of life. And it can, you know, be a fantasy that takes that, that stream of life and brings you to different worlds. It can be a romantic drama that knows that the only way to believe in love is to really see it unfold. And I think that to be rooted in some idea of reality allows the audience to connect with what you're saying and allows people to transcend, or the film to transcend, so. And what do you think are the best examples of that definition of a great film that you just gave us? I'm gonna name a non-black film. Okay. <laughs> I I do, I do like all cinema. <laughs> um, I think a matter of life and death. Uh, uh, Powell and Pressburger. It is my favorite film of all time. 
And it's a film that navigates heaven and hell, or not hell, hev heaven and earth. <laughs> and it does it beautifully by using love as a guide. And it, it transcends what's been done on film up to that point, in my opinion, and truly a lot of what's been done after. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it's really one of the most beautiful films of all time. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought it up because Alicia, Ashley also mentioned it in our, in our conversation earlier. But I'm curious, you know, as a fellow <coughs> student and lover of film, mm -hmm. so I don't have COVID, I have allergies, um, seasonal allergies, but I'm curious about your own journey as a cinephile, you know, like how your, you know, your earliest encounters and experiences of, mm. of the movies and how your taste has evolved mm. over the years. Mm. That's really fascinating. I mean, honestly, I really fell in love with what I considered old movies, when I started realizing that a lot of the remakes that were happening when I was a child, like Freaky Friday and Parent Trap, they, they were remakes of films. And I was using that early jumping off point yeah. to be like, oh wait, there's this Parent Trap movie from the 70s. Like, I should watch that. So I would go to the video store <laughs> and I would get, I would rent it and and get the earlier parent trap and I'd watched it and I was like wait a minute why would they remake this like <laughs> they, they got it right the first time and I love parent trap to be clear the the newer one yeah um but I was like it, that was kind of like my earliest inkling of like wow there's more than what's in front of me <laughs> this idea that you know things were being remade and revived and reimagined I think after that point when I was getting into high school and this was in Baton Rouge. This, yeah, so I was, I started living in Baton Rouge in middle school. Um, so yeah, I would say this is this is Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. um, and when I would when I was in high school, I really realized, and I also was watching TCM. I should say, like I am a lifelong TCM person, mm -hmm. a lifelong HBO person as mm -hmm. well. So I was I was watching things that came on but i wouldn't say that was sparking my curiosity i think i was just digesting what came on so i saw um ching 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 with the trolley mm -hmm. the <laughs> what is the film i can't the trolley yeah, meet me in st louis was, thank yeah. you <laughs> i saw meet me in st louis you know i saw like the the age-appropriate classics you know uh, when i was young but i it never was really like, oh my God, I need to find more films like this. It wasn't until I saw, forgive me, I have so many thoughts going on right now. <laughs> I am all over the place. It wasn't until I saw Dorothy Dandridge films that I was like, oh my God, wait a minute. Black people were, you know, we were classic film stars too. <laughs> and where do you see um, the Dorothy Dandridge films on HBO? Was it? TCM. TV. Yeah, TCM. TCM. TCM changed my life. I mean, it was, it, it up until the point I saw any Dorothy Dandridge film, I was like, okay, like these are cool. Like I, I was invested. It was my personality. It definitely was. <laughs> that I watched TCM. That was, that was my personality. Um, but when I saw her on screen, I was like, wait, I should find more films like this. Like this is really, you know, when you're a child, representation is everything. It, allows you to believe that more is possible and it was just she was the star of the or the month or the day there was the summer and summer to the stars mm -hmm. but i was like wait oh my god you know she's she's a star and um i sought out porgy and bess which famously is hard to find and that was the first time and when i watched it i i was like oh wait <laughs> and i saw this as a child well, in high school and I was like, oh, there's like, it was the first time I was like, wait, there's a world of films that people don't want you to see, even yeah. though that's <laughs> not necessarily, uh, it is true in that film, but I was like, oh, I should, I should follow that impulse. So um, I think me feeling like I was a cinephile to answer your question 
was really me searching for myself in film. But I think I became a cinephile because film chose me. It really, like everywhere I look in my life, in every moment of weakness, joy, I think about, oh, what film am I going to watch to celebrate? And I've always been that way. Yeah. And I've always, you know, thought, okay, I'm having a bad day. I should probably watch The Goodbye Girl. I, you know, I'm having a good day. I should probably watch some rare, obscure movie I've never seen before. And that has just really been the way I navigated life. Like, a lot of people have TV shows that they use as companions to not think about their is- uh, isolation. I have films that I'm you know, <laughs> playing in the yeah. background, and I really have always been that way. Uh, but, yeah. And at this moment, at this point in your life, what are those movies that you have playing in the background? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that I are your companions in life? Oh, my companion right now. That's a, that's a rich question. I think I have many. I, you know, streaming is a very interesting thing because in many ways, streaming makes you feel like all of the films in the world are at your fingertips. But then when you get into streaming, you realize 10% of the films that have ever been made are streaming. And the, the same films are hopping from streamer to streamer. And so in those films that hop around, you know, I have found myself trying to rewatch the minority report a lot lately <laughs> the minority report <laughs> i think there's something about thinking through the state of the world and i'm always trying to find a film that channels that like when the pandemic began i started biking and i started watching vanilla sky and vanilla sky opens in a very empty new york And that's important because I was biking and I biked through Times Square one day and there was no one there. (laughs) It, this was, I want to say this was May, 2020. Not Tom Cruise. The Tom Cruise movie. (laughs) (laughs) There was no one in Times Square and I, and I immediately like, you know, went through my film Rolodex in my head and I was like, oh yeah, I should watch, I should watch Vanilla Sky. But any film that allows me to think through this moment, because I, I, st- I mean, the pandemic is ongoing. That's what I'm gravitating towards. That's what I'm I'm using as a companion. Um, I'm also thinking about when Harry met Sally, of course. I'm thinking about um, all, all the films. Like I, <laughs> I have TCM playing, no matter what I'm doing. Um, yeah. Let's talk about. The Black Film Archive. Yeah. You know, the moment yeah, after watching The Wiz, you had decided <laughs> to work on it. Um, what were kind of the first thoughts that crossed your mind? Like, what were the first things that you felt you needed to do to make it happen? You know what's funny? I feel like I blacked out <laughs> and worked on this nonstop. So I had to go back through my I journal. So I had to go back through my journal in yeah. preparation of this. And a lot of my earliest thoughts were, will this be worthy of the audience I'm trying to serve? Will this will this show them the amount of care that I have for them? Yeah. Will this be something that can grow that I have the time to invest in? Um, and... I was really thinking about design very early on. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, like, how can I show people how much I care? Yeah, I've always worn my heart in my sleeve, and I wanted to do that with my work too. Yeah, and um, yeah, I just I really wanted to do right by these films. I think I think of the actors and the films in the Black Film Archive as an extension of my family. And if you're archiving your family's work, you just treat it with such care and concern and consideration. And I thought, okay, how can I, how can I do that for them? A lot of the film, filmmakers, a lot of the actors had never had their moment. And I thought, at the very least, I don't, I, I didn't think about how it would be received beyond like the points of care that I had. 
So at the very least, I was like, okay, well, let me just give accurate. <laughs> like, let, let me make sure that, you know, this actor's name is spelled correctly, that, you know, th that all of this, because I knew it would be indexed by Google. I knew it would at least do that. And I was like, okay, so if that's true, then I need to make sure that, you know, this this is accurate and good and fair. Um, I think I knew early on that I wasn't just going to take descriptions from other sites, that I was going to write the descriptions myself. Um, I knew early on that for the very first phase, I knew I was going to stop in 1979. Um, and you did this while working a full-time job at the Criterion Collection. Yeah, well, so right. partially, so I started Black Film Archive in June 2020 as a thread. But the actual work, like I, I was talking about the work that I was going to do to make it a website. Um, I started Criterion in October 2020, but before I, I knew before I started the Criterion that I was going to work on a website. So, yes, <laughs> the real root of the work was while I was working full time at Criterion. Yeah. And it's been a year, and it's uh, you know very fascinating how your definition of black film, as you stated on the website, has expanded mm -hmm. and broadened. Um, can you tell us more about that and that it's become more inclusive? Yeah, so the definition on, on Black Film Archive is any film that has something significant to say about the black experience. I think I, the, set, the site itself has expanded because it now includes the 80s. Um, but what, has hap what happened in the 80s is interesting because ideas of blackness are shifting. And I can I can kind of see that happening. Um, there's this film from 1989 called Work Experience, and it's a short that won an Oscar. And it, I also had never heard of it <laughs> until I was uh, like doing my. I, it's it's kind of insane, but I make this long list of all the films that I know of, and then I find the gaps, <laughs> and then I keep a running list of all the films. These even if they're not streaming. I have a list of, a, a really good list of black films from 1898 to 1989. <laughs> um, but I found work experience. And this film, I think, in the 80s, ideas of representation on screen kind of shift. It's not every black film is about blackness. Artists are able to express themselves in new ways, because also the black independent film movement happened again. <laughs> so you have films like Losing Ground, that is one of the earliest films about you know the interior life of a black woman, and but it isn't just about that. It's about a marriage unraveling. It's about you know two brilliant people at odds with what how they think life should be, and suddenly black people are able to define themselves in more expansive ways. And it's just so cool to see that unfold. Um, something I'm working on now, because I also write the blog for Black Film Archive, I'm working on um, the black films of 1982. I'm working on a blog about that, because Losing Ground turns 40 this year. And When did Cane River come out? Cane River in 1982. Oh, OK. <laughs> no, no, wait, 1984? It's Horace. Horace Beach ja Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, 1982. Mm. Uh, someone will fact check us. Yes. <laughs> but I'm curious about, you mentioned, you know, it, it spans 1898 to 1989. Tell me about the Black Vote from 18, 1898. I'm so oh, curious. Yes, yes. Um, something Good Negro Kiss that was just recently um, found by. And it's a full-length feature. No, it's a it's a short. It's a it's really like a snippet. Yeah, it's like a six-second. No, it's longer than six seconds. But it's it's a really it's really 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 short. Um, but I think it's quite special, and it's just affection between two black actors. It's it's very lovely. And I'm curious, where is it streaming or accessible? Oh, it's just on YouTube. YouTube or Vimeo. It's it's on. Yeah, it's on one of them. Um, but it's, you know, I think for the longest, when I first started the site, I was thinking of streaming. And the reason I didn't include it to begin with is I was thinking of streaming as, oh, it's on Criterion Channel, it's on movie, it's on, you know. But I've, I've kind of walked back on that a little bit. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think when you expand the definition of black film on the website, I also remember reading that you mentioned that it covers uh, white reactions or um, perspective oh, on, yeah. on the black experience. I, I think that's a really natural thing because white people are in charge of Hollywood. White impressions of blackness are run throughout black film history. But I think what's special about black actors is they take that little bit of space that they're given and they they use cultural nods and such consideration for black people because if they especially when you're thinking early, early um, black actors, they know that they're upholding the race. And though that is a burden and it, it very much is, they also use it as a space of opportunity. And I'm deeply fascinated by that and they do it so well. Yeah. And I'm curious, what are those examples of kind of the white reactions or perspective and black experience? Gone with the wind, I mean, the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this idea that black lives aren't multifaceted. I think a lot of early black films, um, really, or early films with black people, I should say, really have this this idea that black lives are only this, they're only that, and you know, it it just I think together the films of Black Film Archive show an expanded range of what black lives are and were because. Films have such an important place in getting people to understand uh, cultural attitudes, cultural considerations. Mm. And it for many people, especially if you're thinking 20s, 30s, et cetera, this is how they're learning about black people. <laughs> they might not have a black person in their community, uh, you know, segregation, et cetera. Um, so you also have black directors also do it in the black and early black independent film movement talking about you know the expand like how expansive black film black lives are excuse me um so it's just interesting to see the the dichotomy between those two which i really enjoy yeah i'm curious is there any particular period or wave or movement or you know mm -hmm school in black film that you consider the most creatively and artistically exciting? Oh, yeah. Um, LA Rebellion, I think, is very cool. It it excites me greatly. Um, is this Melvin Van Peebles? No, LA Rebellion is Charles Burnett. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so it's a group of filmmakers who are at UCLA from the late 60s to, they extended to early 80s. Is Haile Garima part of this? That's right, exactly, exactly. So Julie Dash, mm -hmm. um, Haile Garima, Alile Sharon Larkin, the film we're gonna see tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you like most about I think it, that movement, LA Rebellion? Black people were able to express, the black, young, black auteurs were able to express themselves. And it also awakened a new black film movement, I would say. Like, could we have Spike Lee without LA Rebellion? I don't think so. Like, they charted a course that has direct implications for the, the rest of black film history, even if people weren't aware of it at the time. Like, Charles Burnett is... <laughs> Um, you know, making his his student film several friends and just a a slice of life poetry of the everyday film between these group of friends in l a i mean it, it's just you you really up until that point hadn't seen anything like that on film yeah. and it's it's just really it's really beautiful and a lot of the research that's gone into that has been earth shifting for me mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. This morning I had a good fortune of visiting the Black Film Center archive. Um, and it's just remarkable to me um, how the list of films and materials that are available um, mm -hmm. and that we still have access to is dwarfed, I think, 
by the films that are now lost, you know, yeah. um, forgotten, lost memory. Are there any particular films that are not yet in a black film archive that you would hope to find and make available and accessible to audiences now? Yeah, I, I really would love to make the one of the earliest films directed by a black woman, A Woman's Error by Tressie Saunders. And I think that... When did that... When was that made? Who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was 1926. Wow. Uh, so it's, there's a, I think there's a lot of gaps in Black Film Archive because it relies on curators to, one, know a film, two, feel like it fits within what they're curating for their streaming service, or if the streaming service has curators, not all of them do. Um, and I think they're naturally gaps because of that. And then if in the case of A Woman's Error and films that are missing, it requires people to have enough care and curiosity to seek out black films. And of course, places like IU's Black Film Center Archive are doing an essential work in, in ensuring that that happens. And the Library of Congress, and, and there are people who are invested or becoming invested in that, but I think it, it can't just be the Black Film Center Archive. Yeah. It can't just be the Library of Congress there in, or UCLA. I think it requires everyone who is a film pr practitioner to some degree to be invested in films past, films history, um, recognizing orphan films, you know, giving them a second life. Um, you know, if there's a film can in their basement, you know, <laughs> bringing it to someone so we can identify it. Um, I think a lot about the black, there's a black film archive that's very small in Texas, or it's a part of another archive, I believe, that they found canisters of black films in the 80s. And, and these are black films that were made when? Oh, um, they were made pre-1940, I believe. And that them discovering these films in Wiley, Texas, I want to say, mm -hmm. sparked a new era of curiosity in black cinema's past. Um, and um, Ossie Davis <laughs> was a champion of that happening. And I was watching a screener at the Library of Congress recently, and he would come on at the beginning, and he would just say in his very important voice, the film you're watching has been <laughs> is, is the gift of you know someone discovering black films in this basement. And um, you know all we, we all have to do our part. So I'm just taking after Ossie Davis and telling you that <laughs> we all have to do our part. F Black Films Future requires us all to care. Yeah. Yeah. Since you launched um, the Black Film Archive, what are some of the more surprising and unexpected responses, pleasant or otherwise, <laughs> that you've had? Um, yeah, I was at the opening of the Academy Museum's Regeneration which is their exhibit on uh, black cinema from 1898 to 1971. Um, and someone came up to me, recognized me, and started crying. <laughs> it was like, I was not expecting that at all. And they were just like, you don't know what you've done for my life. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I... I, and I've kind of been floored by that sense. Like, it's, wow. Like, I, you know, I for the longest time, I wasn't thinking about how it would be received because I didn't feel like that was mine to carry. I was just going to do the work, get the work done, and show the work when it was done. And what happened from that, it, it was the communities to own. You know, who I did it for, it reached them. And that was my, that was my intention. So honestly, every reaction has surprised me. <laughs> I, I mean that quite earnestly. Um, I think that other things that have surprised me are people younger than me really 
fi- having a newfound interest in the film because this is being delivered to them and the way that they the relationship with film, which is streaming. They're streaming first people, which is quite fascinating. Um, and it th- that surprises me too as well. I th- I'm, I'm genuinely surprised by almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, like, I know we talked about it briefly, you know, yesterday. What do you think is the best streamer? Oh. But there, is there one specific streamer where you think a lot of black films can be found? Where black films can be found. Okay, so I have two different answers. I think that the best streamer generally is most likely HBO Max because it has something for everyone. And it has classic film, it has modern film, it has releases, etc. Black, f- best streamer for black films? That is a difficult one, I would say, Criterion Channel. Yeah. It has Losing Ground. It has um, African-American Pioneers set, which is films before 1940, or maybe through 1940. Yeah. Um, it has A Well-Spent Life. It has it, ha- it, has, a, it has a lot. <laughs> and I think, you know, I've noticed in that in the last year, last two years in particular, Criterion Collection has been... Mm-hmm. rectifying, you know, yeah. <laughs> an earlier oversight, you know, it's released in the past year, films like uh, Devil in the Blue Dress, oh. um, Shaft, you know, the Gordon Parks, um, Learning Tree, yeah. um, the Melvin Van Peebles yeah. box, and I think... Um, Cooley High? Out, yes, yeah. it's coming out soon. Yes. Cooley High, Malcolm X. Malcolm X, yep, that's right. As well, um, if I were to ask you if there are five films um, that you feel represent the breadth and the scope and the diversity of black film that is included, that are included in your archive, what would those five films be and, uh, and why? <laughs> Or more. <laughs> um, oh, on the spot naming. It's not my thing, but I'm going to try. Um, okay. There's a film. And the more I talk about it, the more I'll remember it, <laughs> the name of it. Um, because I see so many films a week. <laughs> okay. Let me think. If I can actually bring bring up a title just because I was struck um, by seeing it there, and I know that it just got released in the new World Cinema Project box set, Sabizanga. Oh, oh my God, what a film. And I think that film is incredible, especially because it centers a woman in... Angola, right? Yeah. Uh, an Angolan woman made the film. The film is set... And Sarah Muldor. That's right. The film is set in. I don't think it's set in Angola. Oh, on the spot is <laughs> no, it's okay. Fine, fine. No, no, it's it's okay. It's okay. Um, but I think the film is is really special because it centers a woman in liberation. I think, or in the fight for liberation. I think women often are only seen as caring for the home. And men are the ones fighting for liberation. And this film kind of subverts that idea. So it really is quite special. I would also say that there is, oh my gosh, I, I'm blanking and it's okay. Things happen. Um, <laughs> I, okay. Oscar Micheaux films, of course, show diversity body and soul is essential yes um paul robeson at his best um the only film i think paul robeson really was able to show his range in a film that wasn't deeply racist um there's an early holly grima short that is really great (laughs) 
and it is called Hourglass from 1971. Um, and I may I recommend Ganja and Hess. Of course. I mean, but that those are I'm trying to I'm trying to dig a little deeper. Like, okay, those are. <laughs> Ganja and has a <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a great film. It's it's a. I just love it. That's why I wanted to film. bring it up. No notes, um, Marling. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic. A dream is what you wake up from, from nineteen seventy four. I want to say. And who directed it? It was directed by a woman. Mm-hmm. And it's a feature. It's a feature documentary. Mm-hmm. I cannot remember the woman's name at this moment. But that film shifted my life. A dream is... What you wake up from. What you wake up from. It talks about poverty, and it it tells it through the story of three couples. And it uses innovative techniques to tell a story, the documentary. And it really illustrates the suffering of black people without without relishing in it, but it, it really does, it really hones in on that. Um, Madeline Anderson's work, I would also say, shows the, uh, she's a documentarian who made films for PBS. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic, fantastic films, like Integration Report. Um, that's that's what I have for you. <laughs> I want to, you know, ask your thoughts on a recent mainstream release that's groundbreaking in its own way. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? No. The Woman King? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what your thoughts on it are? Oh, The Woman King. Um, and it is the first, you know, Hollywood Yeah, it's the first production. Hollywood film of its kind. Yes. I think... The Woman King is special. I think that it also illustrates a point that Black Film Archive does, which is that Black auteurs are given the responsibility of representing the whole race, unlike other people or other artists. And it really is, they're often put in a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. But The Woman King also specifically illustrates that that Hollywood ideas of slavery um, need a savior, be regardless of what it's about. And the Hollywood ideal of the, the slave trade, of all of that needs a morality through line to kind of tell its tale. So I don't think that true radical filmmaking can exist in Hollywood. But I do think that Gina did the best with what she was able to do. Um, for better, for worse. So, <laughs> Speaking of Black auteurs, who do you think are the most exciting Black filmmakers working today? Oh, okay. Mainstream or art house? Um, I think Jessica, Jessica Bashir is changing the game. Faya Dai is one of the most euphoric films I've ever seen. And it's so, it was just on PBS and it is genuinely earth shifting. And it is also in the Criterion Collection. It's also in the Criterion Collection. I got Collection. my own yes, Blu-ray yes, recently. Yes, yes, that is true. Um, I think that Bear Jenkins, his ability to combine love and pain in a film and still make you and still let you walk away with this kind of feeling of triumph after you see one of his films is quite special. Um, I think that I think Gina Prince by the wood has one of the most prolific uh, careers that any black woman director has ever had. Um, Julie Dash is still working, so I, <laughs> I deeply, deeply implore everyone to check out Julie Dash's short, short films, and most of them are streaming on Criterion 
or Canopy. And they are genuinely great. She has such a range and I deeply respect her and all that she does. And I am about to ask you a very serious question. Okay. Um, who do you think are the hottest actors in the Black Film Archive? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'd be remiss to not say Pam Greer because she is the best anyone's ever looked on screen. And Any particular movie? Oh. Coffee? Okay. Pam Greer and Coffee. I, yeah, that's really hard. Pam Greer looks good in everything. She looked good in Bless This Mess, which is a film that I mean, not a film, a TV show that came out maybe four years ago. I mean, she's just that girl. Like, <laughs> she, she, she's the one. She's the chosen one for a reason. And she is good at what she does. Um, and Jackie Brown, of course, she was also wonderful. I will also say Bill Gunn. Uh, <laughs> come on, exactly. Bill Gunn is really also the best. Personal problems. Personal problems. Losing ground. No one's, I mean, that's a man. He he looked good on screen. Like, and he was brilliant. Like, you you couldn't lose with Bill Gunn. Um, he was a screenwriter, an actor, director. I mean, he did it all. He was, it was wonderful. Um, so before we, you know, have the audience, um, ask you questions. I'm going to give you just, you know, words, concepts, abstract, and give me the first movie Ooh, that comes okay. to mind. All right, coming of age. Oh, coming of age. There's a film with Johnny Nash and Ruby Dee from 1969 that I cannot think of the name of, and it's one of the earliest black coming of age true coming-of-age films. So I'm going to say that. And the name will come to me as soon as you say something else. <laughs> Madness. Madness? Tom John Hess. <laughs> and you. <laughs> <laughs> Romance. Mm. Romance. Cane River. Um, best Spike Lee film <laughs> or two. Best Malcolm X. Uh, second best. Um, I like School Days. I like. Hmm. I mean, okay. Obviously, the answer is do the right thing. Being second best. I was trying to, I was like, yeah. maybe there's something. No, let's do the right thing. Well, now we're going to open the floor to questions. Ask me anything. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for being here. My name's Max. Um, you said earlier you don't think radical black filmmaking can exist in Hollywood. Could you speak a little bit more to that and what exactly radical black filmmaking, what, what would you describe that as? Oh, that's a great question. I would say that there's only, w as radical as filmmaking has been in Hollywood, I think has been to finance the completion of the film. So like uh, the spook that's at by the door is a Hollywood film, but he lied about the intention of the film to get the film made. So as long as there is the desire for Hollywood tidiness to exist, I don't think you can truly talk about radical issues and that being the reality of racism, the reality of imperialism, the, ra the reality of uh, sexism, I, a lot of the things have to exist outside of the Hollywood system to be rooted in truth without the morality tale, without the true tidiness that a Hollywood film requires. Maya, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about expanding the archive past U.S. films? Oh, yeah. So... The archive recently expanded to include global cinema. I think when I started, I really was 
focused on black films that were accessible to me. And I've done a lot of work in the past year researching black films globally, and I've taken my time because blackness and the idea of blackness shifts around the world. So I wanted to be as thoughtful as I possibly could be about talking about blackness in Brazil, talking about blackness in Canada, in <laughs> in Italy, in France, um, and, and really think that through. So yes, the that Black Film Archive can now be sorted by country. And just to follow up on that question, you know, do you think there's a fundamental difference between the experience of blackness um, in the U.S. and outside the U.S. and what oh, is that difference? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think in America, blackness, like black f history as a class you can take is a very unique thing. And the way that America thinks of blackness as a construct is a very unique thing. Um, like if I take Italy, for example, they don't have a race-based census. The idea of you being, you're not a black Italian, you're Italian. And you might be Italian Guyanian or Italian, you know, something else. But you're, <laughs> you're, they want you to be Italian first and whatever identity second or not at all. And of the black cinema that you've encountered or experienced outside the U.S., you know, which particular country do you think has the most... Um, Interesting output. Oh, I mean, I'm really fascinated film. by Brazil. I think black Brazilians have really interesting short films, really interesting, uh, just, a re just really, really interesting output and probably some of the longest output of the world cinemas, if you will. Are there any notable Braz black Brazilian directors? Um, mm, for us black Brazilian. There are notable films that feature black Brazilians that I can name <laughs> for you right now. It's Essay Mon... Oh, I'm going to butcher it. It's called... The English title is This World and Mine. And it's parallel stories between a white worker and a black worker, both searching for romance. The black worker ha wants to get a bike so he can uh, be with his one true love. I just think that that's just a fascinating film. It's from 1968, I believe. Um, but it, I think that there are just some fascinating ideas of how blackness, even if it's not the, even if it's just subtext of how it shifts your the life in Brazil. Hi, I'm Essence, a grad student worker at the Black Film Center and Archive here at IU. Um, so I learned um, from personal conversation with you this week that you're about to turn 29. Yes. Um, so happy early birthday. I won't be able to tell you on your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Black Film Archive is already expanding right? Mm -hmm. You said um, to include films from across the di diaspora now yes, and that you've extended into the 80s. Yes. So um, do you see yourself to con continuing to expand the website and this being your life's work or do you have bigger dreams beyond this website? I think yes and. So I think that Black Film Archive is my life's work, but I think I have many lives, and I am committed to taking care of the site, taking care of the work, taking care of the people listed on the site as long as I possibly can. I also am a screenwriter, so I'm on my third script, um, and I think the knowledge that I've acquired building Black Film Archive allows me to write better scripts and it, it allows me to think more thoughtfully about how I'm representing love, how I'm, I'm thinking through um, life's joys and pains 
as a black woman and how film has used shorthands for that across time. Um, shorthands for, you know, being a black woman on screen or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I think that Black Film Archive has only enriched my life and the work that I've done has only enriched my life. And wherever, whatever happens next will be because I invested in myself and the work that I wanted to do without any time, any resources, and I still made it possible. So that'll, <laughs> that'll really, um, yeah, this, this, will, this really is my baby. It's my brainchild that I will continue to take care of. And I think also taking care of it to really answer your question is knowing that there will be a point that I have to expand the team that I was working on it, that I have to think of, make different considerations and I'm not afraid of that point, right? I think doing the best you can by something means knowing when it's time to do, for you to do something else, for you to step away. And I, I think that if it comes to that point, then I welcome it because I've done the best I can and that's all I, I ask of myself. Thank you. Hi. So you mentioned earlier that uh, part of how you come up with the list for the archive is you write down all of the titles you know, and then you fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Are there any of those gaps, those uh, new discoveries to you? Like, is there any one in particular that, that you've fallen in love with uh, in discovering it? Oh, uh, besides work experience, which really blew my mind, I want to say that I'm really fascinated by British black films. There, there's black cinema, true black cinema starts much later than American black films. So y using American black films as a reference point, if you will, like, and the way that they engage with cinema is, it's quite fascinating to me. <laughs> and I, I've been finding myself watching and revisiting the films a lot. Um, there's, uh, Dreaming Rivers, which I also programmed here, um, but I really, really love. <laughs> and it, it just talks about ancestry and forgiving yourself and all, all the things that I, I, I know that Black people here think of, but the way that it, it does there, because I think Black people in Europe from what I know, I'm not black person in Europe, <laughs> but they have like this dual consciousness, if you will, as being from another place, and black Americans do as well. Um, but a lot of their films are about that dual consciousness, and I find myself gravitating towards that right now. I also had a question about um, black films and filmmakers across the world, particularly in Africa. Are there many, and they're in a country where they're not the minority group, but the dominant group, and does that change their stories? Yeah, I think um, the Black Film Center Archive at Indian University did a great project on the work of Paul and Vieira, and he was a black, an African filmmaker who was making films in the 50s. And a lot of his films were uh, thinking about post-Senegalese, uh, post-colonization in Senegal, and how to reckon with that. And he also made this film uh, in Paris. Uh, is it seen on the scene? Something like that. It's from 1956, about. And he's talking to black Parisians about what it's like to live in Paris. And there is, I think there's just this fascination um, about life and <laughs> what does it mean to have this tool and the power in, in the tool of filmmaking. That, that is a common theme that I see and, and also overcoming and thinking through post-colonial thought and also that double consciousness that I was just talking about and using film as a way to navigate that double consciousness post-colonialism is really a lot of the early African filmmaking. Nigerians, Holly, or Nigerians Hollywood, if you will, 
is the third largest uh, film output in the yeah. world. I think India being second. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of it for Nigerian filmmaking is that even if they can be that big, they don't have the power to distribute, distribute yeah. yeah their films outside of Nigeria. And a lot of their films, because for their like early Nigerian filmic films are lost mm-hmm. because people were recording over the film they made to make a new film. Mm-hmm. And preservation processes are happening now, which is great. And you know, we want <laughs> we want film history to be preserved. And Netflix actually just entered they have a studio in Nigeria now. And that's really interesting for the filmmakers there because it's kind of this, you know, we were doing for ourselves and now suddenly there's interest from other people to who are now taking independent Nigerian filmmakers, like Netflix is now able to pay them much more than they were able to, to get through selling their own film. Mm-hmm. And now that's, so it, their Nigerian filmmaking is going through a very interesting moment right now. Yeah. And, I'm excited to see how that unfolds and supporting Nigerian filmmakers, of course. Yeah. And I take it Nollywood started well after 1989, right? That I, yes. <laughs> well after is correct. Yeah, that's why they're not currently <laughs> yes, yes, on yes. the archive. Okay. No, no, there are there are Ni- well also Nigerian films are early that would fit within the archive are harder to find because they were they're lost in many ways. Yeah. Or they're on YouTube, but it may not be the whole thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But the film movement that we know of is Nollywood. Yes. Kind of launched b- yeah. after 89. It launched pre 89. Pre 89, okay. I am not a Nigerian film expert, but I would say around 79. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name's Taylor. Um, earlier you were discussing the lost films you had filled in the gaps with on your list and you mentioned um a 1926 movie a woman's heir and i was just curious like what drew you to that film and like what your first interactions were with it yeah so a woman's heir is still lost to my knowledge um there might be a print of it that isn't at a public archive but i am thinking through women's filmmaking generally and I think a lot of the in po- like entry points for people is earliest first, and that's a lot of the ways that people have asked me about <laughs> film. So I, I want to make sure that I know those entry points because I think that's an early point of engagement for people, and I don't want to dismiss that. But I want to use that as a bridge for people to think of different ways to engage with black cinema, not just this person was the first to do this. Or, because I think when we do that, we minimize a history in a way, um, if that's the only way that we're engaging with the cinema. So, um, yeah, I always want to make sure that I, I know those things because I think they're often asked of me. Um, and, but yes, I hope a woman's era is out there somewhere. I've asked the Library of Congress if they can <laughs> get to it because I'm, I'm really invested in uh, seeing it publicly available. And she made other films I think the thing that's difficult is knowledge of her at that time she people use different names you know a lot of a lot of it can be muddied so for but the one film we know for sure is that she made a woman's error in 1926 um a comment and a question um Wakaliwood is the Ugandan film industry. Ugandan, okay. And it is nowhere near as big in size and scope as Nollywood. Oh, okay. But it's Wakaliwood. Truly wild and worth um, everybody looking into. And a lot of the films are on YouTube. Yeah. Which actually brings me to my question, Maya. You had mentioned in earlier in the conversation that you're pulling back a little bit from a hyperemphasis on streaming. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you would discuss the limitations of curating an archive based on streaming services that are notoriously volatile for what you can and cannot access. That's a very wonderful point. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so something I'm thinking through right now is, 
when I pigeonhole Black Film Archive to streaming, that that requires the whims of often non-Black curators to know the films, be excited about the films, be able to curate them. And I'm now thinking, okay, there's home video. There's, there's YouTube. There are other ways that people access films. How do I ingest that into Black Film Archive? So that is my next task. Home video is the Wild Wild West, I think. Um, there are a lot of things that even if they're on home video, they, you know, the home video came out in 2000 and it, it's still available, but it, it, it's out of print in, in many ways. So it's trying to think through what is a way that that makes sense online. Cause I think the website at, at its current stage <laughs> makes sense and home video kind of, and or expanding the site beyond streaming is a Herculean task, I think. The amount of films quadruples, but I think it's an important one, and I'm not a person who does easy things. I've never believed <laughs> just doing the easy thing. So, whoo, uh, <laughs> we'll see. But it it thrills me to uh, be able to research that, think it through, find a way for it to make sense online. I think that's a really important thing for me. So I'm wrestling right now with including Song of the South the famously banned Disney film. So I'm actively thinking about that conversation. There are a lot of banned movies that I'm trying to contend with. Where where do they go on the website? What warnings do I give people? Like, do, are they categorized differently than other films? So that those are like today, like, you know, <laughs> before I, I um, came to campus today, that's like kind of the research that I'm doing right now. Um, Yes, you're you're right that you know one of the earliest film feature length films, Birth of a Nation, is where a lot of people start with Black film history because that film, to many people, well, a lot of the films that early Black films are in response to Birth of a Nation, so it feels natural for Black cinema history to begin there. Um, Birth of a Nation isn't on Black Film Archive. I think that. It does have something significant to say about the black experience, but what I'm trying to do with Black Film Archive is illuminate, it, it, that's a part of the curation work, it's I'm trying to illuminate different inroads to black cinema. I think people already think of the of early black film history being Birth of a Nation. I don't think I have to double down on that, um, that is a choice I've made. I don't think also anything I do is above critique. I think someone could email me and be like, hey, why aren't the band, which someone did email me, <laughs> why aren't the band um, Disney films here? Why aren't the, and it really got me thinking. So, but really what I want to do is something significant to say about the black experience being the definition is really a guiding point for me. It's significant It and it has a black star writer, et cetera. But where curation comes in is me almost skimming the fat in many ways. Um, but I'm not afraid to have difficult conversations. I don't think, and, and I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't want to be misunderstood. But I think that where I started was with a collection of films that were by black, mostly by black actors talking about blackness on screen, which hadn't really been collected in one place. Um, and I'm now thinking through, okay, if that's your, your base point, you now have an audience to have those like very difficult kind of conversations. And that kind of thrills me. I, and, and truly, as I am thinking through Song of the South, films that, pe that people honestly love, um, other difficult things, I could just say it, is like, Bill Cosby films, for example. He was one of the most important black film stars of the 70s and a TV star as well in the 60s. So, you know, where do all of these things fit? Um, and so that, that's a lot of what I'm thinking through right now and how do I put that on the site? So I think it's a really important question and thank you so much. Silent films that mm. maybe people haven't heard of is there anything that jumps out to you that might require a really excellent score? 
Um, that IU Cinema could commission in the near future? That's that's a good question. There's a, a silent film called it, Sherlock and the Rover? So it's something like that. If you email me, which I'm Maya at blackfilmarchive.com, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you what it is because I think that it would be interesting. It's a short, though. Um, it's Sherlock and I think it is Sherlock and the Rover or some, something, something like that, that I think would be a good silent film for a score. It's a short, uh, mystery tale that I think is, is pretty good. We still have time for about two more questions. I have kind of a selfish question too, actually. I'm just very fascinated by Josephine Baker. Oh, yeah. You know, the American actress who, you know, flourished and prospered is in France. Yes. I mean, there is an Indiana University Press book about her. Oh. Oh. Um, I I think that Josephine Baker is a really fascinating person because she is one of the earliest stars and a true star in the sense that we think of stars now she walks and she walks into the film the film's about her she could be in the film for six seconds the film is about her you do not know anyone else she's on screen with because it, they don't matter she comes on screen and it's josephine baker's film she exits the the film you stop watching it maybe because <laughs> no but really she is she truly is a star she racism didn't give her the life she deserved but what she did with that life is truly fa- like truly incredible. Yeah. I'm curious did she try to make it here in the Hol- you know in Hollywood first? And, yeah. And I mean racism. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know in in the way that we know of James Baldwin to escape to Hollywood, we're not sorry, escape to not Hollywood. Escape to Paris and make a living and even though racism in Paris existed it wasn't as suffocating to be an artist mm-hmm. as it was in America. So you could find the second life where people are fascinated with you, one, being in Paris, and two, being who you are, yeah. and really build a career. And Josephine Baker did that. She did shows. She was a woman of the world in, in a way that you could be <laughs> in Paris. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we had like Josephine Baker, James Baldwin, Nina Simone. Yes, where you, yeah. I mean, the dream of Europe for black Americans is a rich one. Yeah. You impress this idea that I, you know, I don't have to suffocate in the way that I do in America. And so you, all your dreams must be able to come true in Europe, or so we believe. And that concludes our conversation Mm. this evening. Um, Thank you so much for graciously and eloquently answering (laughs) um, our questions. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to IU Cinema, to Dr. Alicia Cosma, to Brittany Friesner for having us here this evening. Thank you all. This is really, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel.